Good morning, Solid Rock. We're going to be reading out of John 6, 22 through 35. On the following day, when the people who were standing on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other boat there, except that one which his disciples had entered, and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but his disciples had gone away alone. However, other boats came from Tiberias, near the place where they ate bread after the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they also got into boats and came to Capernaum, seeking after Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. Then they said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who he sent. Therefore they said to him, What sign will you perform then, that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate the manna in the desert, and as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. And he who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Father, we lift our gazes upon you right now. We thank you for letting us enter into your presence. We boldly come to the throne room to lift you high and lift your son high. We thank you, we love you, and we honor you. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you would just go ahead and just lift your hands to him right now. Thank you for your word this morning, Lord. You are the bread of life. wait on you this morning, God. Lord, we wait on you this morning, Lord. You are worthy of our attention. You are worthy of our affection. You are worthy of our worship. like you. There's no one beside you, Jesus. You are far superior, Lord. You are high and exalted, Lord. We lift your name up, Jesus, above every name. Come on, if you would in this room, just begin to lift up his name. Jesus, we lift up your name. Your name is worthy, your name is righteous, your name is holy, your name is holy, Jesus, Son of God, oh, Oh, we wait for you, Lord, for those 
Seated on his throne, he was clothed in glory and exalted high, and the train. Say that you 
sounds like the waters. Your eyes are full of fire, fairer than the signs of men. Your name is pure and holy. For you alone are worthy. And there is none beside you, Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Your name is pure.
this morning, God, we want to pour out our love.
something anti-cultural going on in the atmosphere. We've all heard the folklore not to fly too close to the sun, Icarus did and got burned. We're all sold. Hurry, 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 hurry calendars, fill it full, color code it. Quick, go, hurry, hurry, hurry. Mediocrity, just get by. See, if you're always in a hurry, you can never be excellent. If you're always looking for the next moment, you can never fully embrace the moment that you're in. And there's something fundamental about the faith of Jesus Christ, this Christianity. Fundamentally, he said, if you want to be great, you have to lessen yourself. And I would argue in our culture, if we could glean a little bit from the scriptures, from the gospels of our Christ, I believe it would be fair to say, sometimes you have to slow down to go fast. Sometimes you have to sit down to stand up. Sometimes you have to kneel. And so as we begin to slow down, I know there's chicken to be ate and clothes to be put up and a family calendar to be filled out so we can be consumed with everything that comes with this week of school starting back. But there is no flying too close to Jesus. There is no burning in pursuit of Jesus. There is a place where we sit at his table. We drink from the cup of suffering that he has already drank of and conquered.
and so we get to drink of the victorious side of the cup of suffering. As we climb up in his lap, Christianity in the West has been so pushed and pressured to hurry, 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 speed, speed, speed. But this book is not conformable to 2024 Western culture. This is the living Word of God. John the Apostle wrote to us that he, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us in the third person of Jesus the Christ. He would do something else that was anti uh, cultural. He would be the one who created the universe. He would be the one who would create everything as part of the Godhead inside of the Trinity. And he would come and suffer and die. See, we say you are holy not because you're clean. Not because I sin and you are sinless. No, we say you are holy because you are so different from anything that has ever been consumed, anything that has ever been figured, anything that's ever been calculated, quantified, drawn up, anything, any idea. You are so different. You reign above it all. You stand above it all. And still yet, although you're holy and although you're different and although you exist outside of everything that we have to offer, you chose to wrap yourself in flesh and dwell among us. And now His Spirit, the victorious Spirit of Jesus, reigns in this room. He reigns in our lives. You are holy. You are worthy. We say you're holy. Not because of what we say, but because of who you are. So let's approach the table this morning. The holy sacrament of holy communion. If you need a moment to gather elements, they're at the front and in the rear. Communion is done on the first day of the week. Not because we have to, but because we get to. Communion is open to anyone who has believed in Jesus and confessed that he is your, their Lord. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to have it all figured out. I'm going to tell you right now, I am not the guard of this table. If you just want to know who he is just a little bit more, there is something transformative in the power of the Holy Eucharist. So today... I will read a couple scriptures as you have time to gather your elements. The Psalm, Psalm 51. The New Living Translation sets it up this way. It says, a Psalm of David regarding the time Nathan the prophet came to him after David had committed adultery. After David, the one in whom we hear was a man after God's heart, in whom we hear danced until his clothes fell off because he was bringing the ark of the holy God back into its rightful place. He failed and messed up, and this is what he wrote after. Have mercy on me, O God. Because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me, clean me from my guilt, and purify me from my sin. For I recognize my rebellion, and it haunts me day and night. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. You will be proved right in what you say, and your judgment is against me. And I will say this. Although I do not guard the table, Paul writes to us and tells us to make sure we examine ourselves. Lord, examine our hearts right now. Oh God, as, as we echo the words of David, clean 
calling us right now to be worthy participants of your body and worthy participants of your blood. Lord, we ask for the real presence inside of this holy moment today. I was born a sinner from the very moment my mother conceived me, but you desire honesty from the womb, teaching me even there wisdom. Purify me from my sins and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be washed whiter than snow. Oh, give me back my joy. I'm here to tell you at the forgiveness of sins, at the communion, at the love and the bride and the communion of Jesus, there is joy. You have broken me, now let me rejoice. Don't keep looking at my sins. Remove the stain of my guilt. Create in me a clean heart, oh God. Renew, renew a loyal, upright spirit in me. Do not banish me from your presence. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Make me willing to obey you. Lord, we lift up your body. As you were lifted up, understanding the significance of this moment, understanding that this is the one thing that makes us part of the, Christ, the body of Christ. This is us reliving the gospel every single week. We lift you up. We recognize that you didn't stay on the cross. We recognize, though, that you were broken and crucified for our sins. Not because we could ever do it without you, but because you desired reconciliation of humanity back to you. So, Lord, we pray. We declare. On the same night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. In the same manner, he took the cup. Jesus, we thank you for your blood. In the same manner he took the cup. He said, this cup, this cup is my blood. Probably not understanding fully what that would mean at that moment, that in just a few short hours, his body would be cut and broken open. This is my blood. Drink this. As often as you drink this, this do in remembrance of me. And Paul goes on to add, every time you eat of this meal, every time of you drink of his blood, you proclaim his death until he comes again. So Lord, we lift up your blood and we say thank you for our spot in history. Transform us and change us into Christ image. Lord, make us who you want us to be. Cover us until you come. We love you, Jesus. See, there's two sacraments in which the Lord commanded, in which we relive the gospel. See, I know many of us in here love to read, but I know many of us in here like to see it and do it with our hands first. I don't know how many of you took a new job and, and you're like, you're sitting there watching a screen or a video or you're watching somebody else do the job, but you can't really learn it until you do it with your own two hands. Can somebody testify that I'm not out on a limb here? 
And in the sacraments of baptism and communion, we get to do something with our hands that relives the gospel. It is not mere symbol. It has been relegated to a mere symbol for history for all kinds of years. But I'm telling you, it is the gospel that Jesus said when you meet together with this meal. And when you go through the waters of baptism, you get to physically see and proclaim the Lord is risen. And He is here and He is not to be relegated and He is not to be shut down. He is not to be silenced. It's not a theological matter. It's a Jesus said it so we can proclaim He's good and He's alive forevermore. I'm tired of us fighting over the little things. Oh, we love you, Jesus. you with the kiss but that is scriptural but it ain't it ain't that kind of kiss and we're just a little too far into Winston County all right while you're standing let's go ahead and let the children's church come I'm gonna give you some announcements tonight at uh, 630 pastor Gary will resume the uh, Sunday night intercessory prayer so at 630 What's that, man? This bump. Good deal. Children's church, children's ministry is coming, um, and then Wednesday night our youth meet from six to seven thirty, and they get fed. And if you're interested in feeding, please do that. 
Um, small. Oh, uh, thank you. The Lord will bless you. I, I'll take it this week. I lost two pounds. Y'all are so sweet. That's some good fruit. Some good fruit coming out of children's ministry. Let's just take a minute to, let's, I know this is, y'all are like, man, it is not going to be 12 o'clock today when we leave. Let's just give a round of applause to all of our children's workers, nursery workers, because the more, they just continue, continue and continue to surprise me. So as I, um, as I'm, as, as, go ahead and begin to bring your tithes and your offerings. I know some of you have done that. You can drop those right here in the front. While all of our children are getting sorted and situated, you can bring your tithes and your offerings. Did I miss, did, did I miss any announcements? Yeah, you did get taller. Any, anybody know if I missed any announcements? Hebrew Heritage on Friday nights? I, I think that's it. Do what? All right. Hallelujah. Lord, we love you so much. Lord, we come again before the holy throne of a risen Jesus. We come before the throne of a God who created everything. And Lord, we thank you that you know the end of a thing before the beginning. So Lord, we pray over every single child involved in this ministry. Lord, we thank you that you continue to weave together seeds that are going to set them up for a foundational future, a theologically rich future. Lord, I thank you that they encounter your word and your presence, your grace, your love, and your peace. In the name of Jesus, Lord, I thank you for every single seed that is sown. Lord, I thank you that you have made this house a house in which we can change the community and give back. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Bless every sower. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Children's Church, y'all can be dismissed. Y'all can remain standing, if you will, since you're almost all standing, and we'll just jump straight into the Word. 2 Samuel, chapter 11. We're picking up immediately where we left off last week. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. When the period of mourning was over, David sent for her and brought her to the palace, and she became one of his wives. Then she gave birth to a son, but the Lord was displeased with what David had done. So the Lord sent Nathan the prophet to tell David this story. There were two men in a certain town. One was rich, one was poor. The rich man owned a great many sheep and cattle. The poor man owned nothing but one little lamb he had bought. He raised that little lamb, and it grew up with his children. It ate from the man's own plate and drank from his cup. He cuddled it in his arms like a baby daughter. One day a guest arrived at the home of the rich man, but instead of killing an animal from his own flock or herd, he took the poor man's lamb and killed it and prepared it for his guest. David was furious. As surely as the Lord lives... Any man who would do such a thing deserves to die. Any man who would do such a thing deserves to die. He must repay four lambs to the poor man for the one he stole and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are that man. You are that man. Lord, we love you so much. Lord, I ask as I stand upon your platform behind the holy desk of God that I would speak something straight from the realms of heaven. Lord, I ask you to speak through everything that you want to speak through today. Nothing more, nothing less. Lord, I ask for ears that are able to hear, distractions to cease, and hearts ready to receive from the living word of God. In the name of Jesus, I pray you may be seated. David was furious. As surely as the Lord lives, he vowed, 
any man who would do such a thing deserves to die. Then Nathan said to David, you are that man. The next couple of scriptures go on to have this declaration against David. There's this prophecy about a coup coming from his own household. Verse 12, in that part of the scriptures, God declares to David, you've done something in secret, and I'm going to make this other stuff happen to you openly. And finally, in about verse 13, David confesses of his sin. The Lord forgives him. You are that man. When we can read the scripture through the lens of us not being the hero but the villain, it begins to change the paradox in how we see our life. Oh, that didn't preach good. I didn't expect it to. We're very quick to identify with the good parts of David and the grace that God uh, puts out on David. But we also have to understand if we want to begin to identify with biblical characters, you and I are that man. We have done things, even if we lived according to the, the church, the most perfect life, we have done things in which David would say, you deserve to die. And so what we have to understand, you are that man, becomes an invitation to the cross of Jesus. Remember, Jesus invites us to the cross Even before his disciples understood the implications of this, Jesus in Matthew 16 says, Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up the cross and follow me. So, some of our readings this week are going to stir some discomfort in us. We're going to see progressively in the opening scriptures, and I really would, would really urge you all to get here in time, because it all flows together. Opening scriptures, table scriptures, and message scriptures all flow together. And so I'm going to reference opening scriptures throughout the sermon that you need to have been here for. Okay? I get it. I get it. I know a lot, but I'm just saying, try to get here at 1032 or 3 at least. It all flows together. And so the next couple of weeks, we're going to see Jesus in our opening scriptures. Alec read last week. Jesus begins to preach, and he feeds all these people. And then it begins to transition, and Jesus is like, he perceives that they're going to make him a king, an earthly king, because they're hungry for something that is physical. And so Jesus perceives they're going to make him an earthly king, so he begins, he disappears. And then today, in our opening scriptures, we see that Jesus begins to pull away a little bit more and say, I am the bread of life. And as we progress forward reading in in John chapter 6 through the lectionary, we're going to find that Jesus is going to get even more and more offensive because his purpose was not to grow a a megachurch, to build a new campus every time there is a certain population. Jesus was not the CEO of Dollar General. Thank you, Pastor Benny. One amen. Just in case, if you need to use your phones real quick to Google the CEO of Dollar General, I would be willing to put a dollar on it. It's not Jesus the Christ. And so he, he begins to go further into those scriptures, and, and then we're reading, we're, we're, we're seeing David come against some things, and we're going we're gonna to read some things in our, in our scriptures this week and in the coming weeks that are going to cause some discomfort in us Because I have committed to reading through the lectionary and not just preaching TBN style. (laughs) I knew a preacher one time was pretty good, pretty pretty successful. He had eight eight he had eight sermons, and I heard all eight of them twelve times. And they preached good, and he could get a bunch of money in the offering. No comment. Because the Word of God is a living, breathing thing. It is, it is Jesus revealed to us in our moment, yes, but it is also transcends time. It's not meant to only be a happy, rah-rah cheerleader. 
we can draw encouragement even from the scriptures that are uncomfortable. That's one of the seemingly paradoxical things about the Word of God. Messy text can help us pursue holiness. David, in our sermon today, in our, in our scriptures today, is confronted with blatant sin. If you remember our scriptures last week, we said it, and I emphasized, he was told that Uriah uh, was Bathsheba's husband. He was told that she was a wife, but he went on anyways. And David has to be told this story before he finally gets what he did was wrong. He was a man who loved God and missed it. And so we can draw some encouragement that if we've missed it, there's forgiveness and there's grace, and he's always constantly drawing us back, even if we blatantly missed it. These words, these words of the scriptures, these, these texts, they echo through the ages. We, if we will commit to reading the scriptures, we will find that everybody in here other than Jesus fell short at some point in time. They grumble, they complain, but there is a gift that stands on the chasm between life and death, that transcends all time, and that gift is the cross of Calvary. Amen. That gift is Jesus Christ. He is the bread of life. He's Emmanuel, God with us, the Messiah. And when we understand and when we begin to have a heart reaction to the grace of God, we can find in that moment that we can go from being like that man to a new creature, to being transformed What would be some tendencies of that man? What should we watch out for? Well, let's go to some more of our lectionary scriptures today in Exodus chapter 16. I would title this section, Grumbling and Complaining. And that's a nicer way of what I would have been told as a child. Three of you got that. I'm on a roll today. Sometimes my jokes have so, they're so bad that two people just give me a pity laugh. Exodus 16, verse 2, Dan's got it up. He's like, come on, man, let's go. There too, the whole community of Israel complained about Moses and Aaron. I, I promise this is in the lectionary. I didn't, I, nobody's been complaining and I thought that, hey, I need to get on to him from the pulpit. There, too, the whole community of Israel complained about Moses and Aaron. If only the Lord had killed us back in Egypt. Could you imagine? What? If only the Lord would have killed us back in Egypt, they moaned. There we sat around pots filled with meat. We ate all the bread we wanted. Notice this theme. We ate all the bread we wanted. But now you've brought us in the wilderness to starve to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, Look, I'm going to rain down food from heaven. Each day the people can go out and pick up as much food as they need for that day. I will test them in this and see whether or not they will follow my instructions. God was about to provide something temporary for them. Egypt was temporary, but it was comfortable. And see, humans, we don't seem to mind becoming slaves if we get enough of what we want. And one of the tactics of the enemy is to give us just enough entertainment and just enough goosebumps that we actually begin to feel like that's what relationship with Jesus is like, and we begin to walk away from the orthodoxy of the faith. Mega churches aren't built because they're in there teaching people the orthodoxy of the faith. Thank you, Pastor Vinny. I know that's not fun. And I, and I know that God uses megachurches. I'm not preaching against megachurches. I'm just saying that there has to be an understanding that the enemy really, really, really wants us to, to take just a little bit of what we think we want and what we think is good for us and what we think we have our free will and we're just wrapped up in bondage because we're in Egypt and we're, 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 we're free enough. 
We can go to church and we can dance and we can fill our goosebumps. Or we can read our word and we can, we can do our goosebumps. Or we can read our theology books and we can get something up in our brain. And that's what we, but it is not the same as being willing to leave all of that behind and trek out into the wilderness. But see, in the wilderness, you have to be ready to crucify that man. We have to be willing to get up on the invitation of Jesus to the cross or we will get out of bondage just to want to be back into bondage. And when you have a desire, one of my mentors used to say this to me in, in a sales role, people will always do what they want to do, not what they need to do. I pull people's credit all the time, and it's very apparent people do what they want to do, not what they need to do. People will do what they want to do, not what they need to do. And so one of the tactics of the enemy in modern American churches is to give you enough of what you want by figuring out how to keep you in bondage. And the American church has responded by giving you enough entertainment to make you feel like you're no longer in bondage, but you've just swapped one Egypt for another. It's temporary. Egypt was temporary and strategic for God. Bondage, if you will allow it, hard things can create in you something of grit that will make you something you never would have been had you had a pansy life. But if you moan and complain about the time you were hurt, you will never transform anything into anything. And listen, you do not get a position in the kingdom of Jesus. I'm not talking about on a platform. I'm talking about you cannot eloquently describe the suffering servant to someone if you have never allowed your suffering to be given up to him. Because sometimes it's our suffering that's keeping us in bondage. The pain of life can propel you to places in the kingdom or it can totally disable you from doing anything. So they complained in the wilderness. Then look at this. Let's read these really quickly. Starting in verse 9. Then Moses said to Aaron, announce this to the entire community. Present yourselves before the Lord for he has heard your complaining. As Aaron was speaking to the whole community of Israel, they looked out towards the wilderness where they saw the awesome glory of the Lord. They saw the glory of the Lord in the cloud. Then the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the complaints. Now tell them, in the evening you're going to have meat to eat. In the morning you'll have bread, all you want. Then you'll know that I am the Lord your God. That evening vast numbers of quail flew into the camp. The next morning the area was filled with a wet dew. When the dew evaporated, a flaky substance as fine as frosted blankets blanketed the ground. The Israelites were puzzled. What is this? They had no idea what it was, and Moses told them, it's the food the Lord has given you to eat. See, that's the thing about the wilderness. God can begin to do something in your bond, with your bondage, if you'll let him, that is strategic. For instance, when the children of Jacob, Israel, went into Egypt, there were 70 of them. When they came out at this moment, they're mumbling and complaining, and there's like two and a half million of them. What happened in bondage created a nation. And then we get out of bondage, and then we're like, we don't really know what to do because we felt like the bondage was strategic. And then we get into the wilderness, and we're just kind of wandering around. But the wilderness can also teach us something of vast importance, and that's unmitigated dependence upon God. See, they had no other way but to follow the glory cloud, the fire by night, and eat the manna and the quail. But the wilderness was not the promise. The wilderness is a teaching ground. And we have to be careful in the wilderness or we'll want to set up camp for 40 years. Still, even with, uh, even with provision and guidance in the wilderness, they grumbled and they complained. Wilderness is seasonal. We are called to live an, in, uh, an intentional life of pursuit. If we're not careful, we'll want to stay when he says move. We'll want to grumble in our wilderness and in our bondage, and we'll forget the faithfulness of God. Yet, God continues working, even in the midst of their and our grumbling. 
and still yet we may fall short. It's another subheading of what to watch for. You are that man falling short. David's sin and repentance serves as a powerful reminder that we all fall short. And like David, we all need God's mercy and forgiveness. And Psalms 51, which is what we read at the table, there gives us powerful imagery of what true repentance looks like. It le- true repentance looks like and it leads to transformation and a renewed relationship with God. Amen. Repentance is not filling out a church card and showing up for three or four weeks. It's not being dunked in water. Repentance is something we, we find when we read the, the uh, book of Acts in the second chapter, we see pierced hearts as the NLT would would write that. There is something on the inside like we find in Psalms 51. It's a falling short. It's a reminder. We all need him. It's an invitation to the cross. It's an invitation to his table. No matter whether we've been serving him forever or whether we just got on board last week. It's 1 John 8. 1 John 1, 8 through 10 would say, If we claim to be without sin, we just deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, though what? He is faithful and just and will forgive us of all of our sins. Purify us from all unrighteousness. The psalmist would declare, I'm going to read a couple of these to you again. Have mercy on me, O God. Because, I'm, uh, because of your unfailing love. See, many of us get to a certain status in life. We say, oh, I don't think I need God anymore. He, David is king, and he is in this place of, I need God. For I recognize my rebellion, it haunts me day and night. I wonder how many of us walk openly and willingly in rebellion, and it never haunts us. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew an upright spirit in me. Don't banish me from your presence. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of salvation. Make me willing to obey. You see, that's the thing with Western Christianity. Rebellion don't haunt us no more. I'm not sure we even collectively or individually beg God for mercy and compassion. The the psalmist here was so concerned about living without the presence of God and the Holy Spirit. The children of Israel, they're in the midst of their grumbling and their complaining and their discomfort. So much that I would would point and declare that I'd rather be living, they said, I'd rather be living as a slave than free without the comforts of my bondage. And we've all been there. It's not like we haven't. The kingdom of God is not about comfort. It's comfort to those who are downtrodden, yes. It's comfort to those who are oppressed, yes. But see, yet again, there's this paradox. There's this challenge to comfort that comes from Jesus. You you must be my hands and feet. You must comfort those. You must mourn with those who mourn. You must be, what he, what, when he's preaching the Sermon on the Mount, he's telling us all these things. And then he's telling us, you must take up your cross. You must crucify yourself. You must die daily. Jesus, what Jesus is doing here is he's constantly challenging what hungers us. What gets your attention? What are you hungry for? What are you hungry for? It's at the table. It's at the Eucharist. We go, and the word, remember, Eucharist means thanksgiving. I give thanks. I I, I partake in this meal weekly because I can give thanks to Jesus. I can give thanks. I can give thanks to Jesus. I can remember Jesus and I can say, hey, till you get back. Because the the, the early church lived with expectancy that he was coming back around any corner. They lived with the expectancy. Read the book of Acts. Read the epistles. They lived with the expectancy that he could show up at any moment. And so they took seriously some things that we don't take seriously anymore. And it's at this Thanksgiving meal weekly that we can ponder, what am I hungry for? What hungers me? What satiates me? What satisfies me? 
we must continually be willing to be broken for the sake of Christ. David, in our second Samuel readings, comes face to face with his brokenness. In the depths of his sin, he is broken. Our Exodus reading from Israel, they come face to face with their need. They were hungry. They're longing for something, though. They were longing for something temporary and physical. And, and, they, and in one way, they almost missed the entire point of their rescue. Rescue doesn't mean utop utopia. Rescue is the first step towards promise. Some of, us, some of us get out of, just a little bit out of bondage, and we're in wilderness, and we're like, this, this ain't what I thought it was going to be. No, because you have to actually fight to get to the promise. Sometimes there's a wilderness, sometimes there's a pit, sometimes there's a cross before the promise. And those things don't fill a building, and those things don't get a whole bunch of uh, connection cards filled out, and those things don't create a successful TV or radio ministry to say you're going to suffer. But let me tell you something. In the history of the church, suffering has been more... Uh, connected with Christ than all of the other things that have come about in the last 75 years. And what has made the church unique, y'all, is that in spite of the suffering, whether it would be war or plague or death, or, or, or remember when infants were dying, so you'd, you'd have 26 kids and only three would live. In the midst of the suffering, there was joy unspeakable and full of glory. And there was something that marked the church. It wasn't because we got a new Lamborghini. It wasn't because we had built four new sanctuaries. It was because there was something on the inside of me that though I suffer, he is better. Oh, there was something that began to change and shift. They would say, although hell is selleth, I shall not be moved. And it was in the suffering that our brothers and sisters that got brought over here on, on boats from Africa, they would sing things like, I shall be free. I'm just a sojourner passing through. And it was in their suffering that if you could go back to the 1850s and look out in a field of people that were beaten Broken and mistreated in every shape and form and fashion, they would sing. Spirituals. And there would be joy flowing from the cotton fields. That's the church of Jesus. Not a Gucci suit. The things that some people that we will never know their names. Like Steph said, this could credit this to Steph. There are people who are famous in heaven that we will never know their names on this, on this side of glory. And there are people who have written books after books after books that we continue to give money to, writing their books and, and, and giving them this big old jet, and heaven don't know their name. I'm going to tell you something. There's some books by some dead people that speak more life to me than some of the books by some of the alive people. And we have to understand, what, are we in danger of slipping out of the orthodoxy of the church? Because what we do and what we call church today looks very, very, very different than it has in the last 1950 years. I don't know where none of that came from. Worship team, come on. In our posture, we must become a people who are postured to pursue. Jesus calls us to be reconciled. Ultimately, manna is temporary. Ultimately, the, the uh, wilderness is temporary. Jesus transcends time, space, and matter. Jesus becoming your father, Jesus becoming your lover, transcends everything that you'll ever have, every mountain high, every valley low, every river wide. I'm going to sing a good song here in a second. He will transcend every bit of that. Jesus is the answer. He is the long-term answer. And let me tell you something. You, uh, Paul would write later to the church at Ephesus, and he would say, I beg you. Go there, Pastor Dan, 4-1. 
I beg you to lead a life worthy of the call. You've been called by God. I beg you to leave a, live a life worthy of the call. There's more to this than 26 minutes on a Sunday morning. We must begin to examine what are we hungry for. Are we this man that, that, that has refused to crawl up on the cross? What makes, us, what makes us really get out of bed in the morning? Is it Jesus? Is it being able to share the joy and the love and the goodness of God to those around us, understanding who he really is? Or is it just another day? Just another day. Just another dollar to my Roth 401k. What, what are we living for? What hungers us? Jesus says, don't look for things that are temporary. Are we hungry for the right bread? Are we hungry for the bread of religion? Are we hungry for the bread of self? What are we hungry for? Jesus says, I am. Steph read this morning, I am. He says, I am the bread of life. He would begin to proceed forward and use those words specifically, I am. I am. Echoing back to the God of the mountain. When the God of the mountain would say, I am who I am, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He will provide for you every step of the way through every bit of the wilderness. He will propel you to the promise. If you've been hurt, if you've been abused, if you've been uh, put down, if you've been stepped on, if you've been kicked, whether that's been in the church or outside of the church, I'm here to tell you, if you will let him, he will take every bit of that pain and propel you to your promise. Give us this day our daily bread, and that is the bread of Jesus. Jesus, the Messiah. Jesus satisfies our deepest hunger. He provides us eternal life. As we receive him, we receive life. As we eat of his bread, we become nourished like never before. And we get to go from you are that man to you are a new creature. Your identity transitions and changes when we climb upon the cross. May we embrace this transformation. Why? Because we need to live as the image of Christ in our community. We need to be so changed. We need to be so propelled from the place that hurt us and the place that confuses us and the place that binds us up and the place that's got us looking every different direction, the place that has us falling time and time and time again, the place that has us grumbling and complaining, the place that has us picking our own way, choosing our own way. We've got to get beyond that place because Jesus said, you are the light of the world. They've got to see him in you. A city on a hill that cannot be hidden. Stand as we pray. When I finish this prayer, if you'd like prayer for anything, the altars are open. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Oh, Jesus, give us this day our daily bread. Lord, I pray that we continually eat of you, Jesus, and nothing inferior. Lord, make us hungry for you and nothing else. God, forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who have trespassed against us, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Yours is the kingdom, O oh God, the power and the glory forever and ever. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness. 
We bless you for our creation, Lord. We bless you for our preservation. Lord, we bless you for every blessing of this life, but above all, oh God, for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ for the means of grace and the hope of glory. God, I pray for me and for these people, for this house, for this community. Lord, I pray that you give us an awareness of your mercy every morning with thankful hearts that we show forth in our lives, in our communities, in our church, in everything we do, Lord, that we show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but also in our lives. Lord, that we give ourselves, Lord, we give ourselves to your service. We walk before you in holiness, righteousness all the days of our lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Be all the honor and glory forever. Glory to God the Father, the creator of heaven. Glory to his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Glory to the Holy Spirit. Come, Lord, do what only you can do. Transform us from being that man.
closing. One of the most one of the most uh, orthodox creeds, if you will, that um, helps keep us balanced. I'd like for us to say the creed, to declare the creed, to pray the creed as we leave. So we'll start right now. I believe in God the Father, Almighty Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day, He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father, the Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Be blessed. I hope to see you all again next week. Bring three or four friends with you. <laughs>